Hello, and welcome to the Sustainability Leaders Podcast, part of the Jobs with Impact compendium of resources for people who want to make a positive impact on the world. I'm David Rosenheim, your host. Every week, we bring you in-depth conversations with people who are leading the way to a sustainable future. I hope these conversations will be as inspiring to you as they are to me, and most of all, I hope that they'll empower you to take action. The planet needs you. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to jobswithimpact.com. This episode is part of the California Leadership Series, where we focus on changemakers in California government who are shaping the most innovative energy and climate policy anywhere, transforming the world's fifth largest economy and beyond. Our sustainable business sponsor for the California Leadership Series is Lyft. Lyft is the fastest growing rideshare company in the U.S. and is available to 95% of the U.S. population. Lyft is preferred by drivers and passengers for its reliable and friendly experience and its commitment to effecting positive change for the future of our cities as the first rideshare company to launch a carbon offset program. And now, all Lyft rides are carbon neutral. To learn more, visit lyft.com slash carbon. Today's episode is also sponsored by E2, Environmental Entrepreneurs. If you are a clean energy business leader looking to add your voice to policy discussions happening in your state and nationally, E2 is your go-to partner. With nine chapters from California to New York and over 5,000 members and supporters working and doing business in every state, E2 unites real on-the-ground business leaders who want to advocate for smart, clean energy policies that are good for the economy and good for the environment. For more information, visit e2.org, that's E and the number two, dot O-R-G, and click the Connect with E2 button on the top of the page. A few weeks ago, I flew down to LA to record three interviews that I'll be sharing with you over the coming weeks. To open the new year, I'm delighted to share the first of these interviews, a live conversation with Mary Nichols, likely the most accomplished and certainly the most powerful environmental regulator in the United States today. Mary is chair of the California Air Resources Board, an agency that oversees air quality across sectors ranging from transportation to energy and from agriculture to the built environment. She first served as CARB chair in Governor Jerry Brown's first administration in the late 70s and early 80s, and was appointed again in 2007 by Governor Schwarzenegger. She continues to hold the post today. In this conversation, recorded in front of an audience at NRDC's Robert Redford Building in Santa Monica in December of 2018, Mary Nichols shares her personal story, from her roots in Ithaca, New York, to her time as the first female reporter for the Wall Street Journal, to her post overseeing air and radiation section at US EPA under Clinton, to one of her current roles as negotiator in chief with the Trump administration as they seek to pull out of the Paris Agreement and roll back California's right under the Clean Air Act to regulate vehicle emissions. In this far-ranging conversation, Mary shares her advice to those seeking to make careers out of saving the planet. She's been a mentor and inspiration to me and many others, and I know you'll enjoy our conversation. Please share it with your friends. So Mary Nichols, thank you for joining the podcast. Uh, we're here at NRDC's Santa Monica offices. It's a beautiful setting. And it must be sort of coming home to you. You are credited with having opened NRDC's LA office. I did, but I didn't get a chance to work in this building. It was built after I had already moved on. But uh, I visited it many times, and it does feel like home. So what was, just briefly, where, where was the original LA office, and what was that experience we like. started out uh, in the heart of downtown Los Angeles in a historic building called the Oviet Building, which was the first men's department store in Los Angeles. And on the top floor was the apartment that Mr. James Oviet lived in, which is uh, now owned by the LA Conservancy, and they use it sometimes for special events. It's an absolutely beautiful Art Deco building. It was the last building in Los Angeles, I think, to have a human-operated uh, elevator. And uh, we picked the site because 
it was emblematic of uh, good land use planning. We thought that we would be in the heart of the city and um, it would be accessible by transit. But uh, it turned out that the space was too small there was no parking, and um, it was very inconvenient both for our members and our uh, staff. So gradually, we moved west. And here we are now in the Robert Redford building. So I want to actually start uh, with your upbringing. And I know that you're from Ithaca, New York, a beautiful spot. You're the daughter of a three-time Democratic Socialist mayor. What did your mom do? Well, actually, my mother was a politician before my father was, so just to uh, correct the record slightly here. Um, I was born in Minneapolis, and uh, my mother had already finished college when she met my dad. My dad dropped out of Cornell in order to enlist in the Army in World War II. And at the end of the war, they had me and went back to Ithaca, and he finished his undergraduate degree. Uh, while she was uh, teaching. And then um, he eventually got his doctorate. Uh, he was, it was a, one of those uh, post-World War II stories where he was, his field, electrical engineering, was very hot. And so Cornell just kept him first as a grad student and then as a faculty member, and he spent his whole, his whole career there. Uh, my mother started out with a PhD in French literature and uh, was not able to get a job because in those days the university had an anti-nepotism rule, which meant that even though my dad was in the engineering school and she was in uh, letters and sciences, uh, she couldn't be hired if he was there. So she took her uh, degree and went down the hill to the Ithaca Public Schools where Thanks to the state of New York, uh, she made more money than my dad did, <laughs> which is something she was very proud of, as you can imagine. Um, she was also a very popular teacher, and when a seat on the city council opened up um, in our neighborhood, um, people asked her to run, and then gradually my father followed in her footsteps. And did your sense of civic duty sort of develop uh, at an early age in, in, in watching your parents, or, or did that come later? Well, you know, civic duty sounds kind of dull and unpleasant. How about, activi I don't How about <laughs> activism? Is that I don't feel that way about it. Um, my parents were politically active, uh, and I do remember from a very early age being taken to, uh, you know, campaign headquarters and uh, collating. I was very good at collating things, um, which was, you know, they didn't have machines to do that in those days. But honestly, uh, I grew up in a, in a politically active family, and I was told stories about my grandparents, who had both uh, emigrated from uh, Eastern Europe and had been very active in, um, in labor organizing. And so it was just something that was, uh, it wasn't what everybody in our community was doing, for sure, but it was just what my family did. Now, you studied uh, Russian literature. I did. As an undergrad, right. uh, following sort of in the footsteps of, of your mom. Any particular uh, writers or, or works that stuck with you? Well, uh, you can't go wrong with Tolstoy, uh, but um, I actually got, <clears throat> excuse me, I was interested in Soviet literature, which is mostly pretty awful, but there are some really good writers, and I thought it would be fun to learn more about what they were up to, and I actually translated a play as a project that I did in my senior year. I was very into theater, so my other life was really around uh, the drama department and uh, writing and directing plays, and so there was a sort of a crossover there. You had the opportunity uh, at some point in your college career, uh, a summer I believe, to help register black voters in Tennessee. How did that experience shape you? I went to Fayette County, Tennessee with a group of uh, students and faculty from Cornell who uh, were organized by one of our colleagues who was one of the very first of the Freedom Riders, the people who integrated the uh, then segregated bus system. So there were a group of people from Cornell who had, um, in the late 50s and early 60s, 
traveled around the South on what were then segregated buses trying to um, change that. One of them uh, had spent some time in Fayette County, which is an interesting place. It's on the border of Mississippi, right next door to uh, Memphis. And it is a, it was in those days, it's now a bedroom suburb of Memphis, but it was an agricultural place, 90% uh, black. Uh, most of the blacks were sharecroppers, although there were a few who owned land. And um, there was basically one white man in the county who was kind of a maverick who wanted to run for sheriff, and he thought that the way to do that would be to register black voters. So uh, we were invited to come in and spend a summer working on voter registration and helping the campaign of this uh, man, uh, Redfern, who was running for sheriff, and another uh, candidate, we had another candidate who was black, who was a minister, uh, the Reverend June Dowdy, who was running for tax assessor. So we organized this summer, and this project actually went on for uh, another couple of years afterwards before it uh, fell by the wayside, as, as a lot of bad things happened in the late 60s in our, in our country. But at that point, it was, uh, it was an amazing time. We lived in the homes of sharecropper families uh, and, you know, drove our old beat-up cars around on the dirt back roads and talked to people about registering. We went to churches on Sunday and on Wednesdays when they opened up the uh, registration office, the registrar's office in the county seat of Somerville, uh, we would pick people up or encourage them to go down and stand in line and try to register. And the registrar's op office would be open for an hour, and then it would close, and even then they might only allow a couple people through, and you know, we experienced all the all the tricks that, that one does. Um, but that are, it that was- are still in play, unfortunately. <laughs> some of which are either in play still or back again to deny people uh, the ability to participate. That's exactly right. Uh, but, you know, we were welcomed uh, very strongly by the community, and um, so it was, it was a great experience. Did you, at that point, have a sense of the environment? What was your experience of, of nature? I well, think, <laughs> first of all, my life? experience of nature, I guess, came from growing up in Ithaca with a father who uh, was an atheist and didn't want to have us feel, us, my brother and me, feel like we were left out in a small town where everybody went to church on Sundays. So on Sundays, we went for walks out in the countryside and got lectured by my father about various things, <laughs> about nature. And there were a lot of other people in Ithaca, actually, who were very into uh, the, the surrounding community. It's, just, it's a beautiful place, and there are people who are uh, who are you know actively engaged? It's also kind of an agricultural community as well. But there were there were a lot of people who were participating in outdoor activities and just interested in nature study. That I guess the the first uh, one of the first books I remember having was a handbook of nature study, which featured the plants and animals of upstate New York. So you know we learned about those things when when I was a little kid. Um, but my uh, transition to the work that I have been doing for my pretty much my whole career really comes through the law initially, and that very much springs from my experience in the civil rights movement, where it was clear that um, the people who were actually making a difference in terms of taking what the organizers were able to do and translating it into action were people who were able to go to court and get things done. And so that was where I began to get the idea that that's what I wanted to do. And you studied law at Yale. Yes. Uh, in a cohort that was 90% male. Uh, my class was the lar had the largest number of women that Yale had ever had because of the Vietnam War. So there were men who were deferring in order to avoid the draft, and they filled up the class with women. 10%. 10%. Yeah, right, right. right. And you met your future husband, John Tom, uh, at Yale as well. I did. Um, 
Did you study environmental law? Was there such a thing as environmental law? No, the there time? were no environmental uh, textbooks. There was not a course in environmental law until my third year of law school when uh, a professor who was a property law professor uh, put together a course in environmental law, which was really focused on things like trespass and nuisance as a, as a way to think about uh, pollution problems. There wasn't any statutory basis for environmental law at that point. All of the major uh, laws that we think of as having been there forever, like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, or even NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, were passed uh, right at the end of my law school time. You spent some time at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, now, I've, I've read that you were either the first or among the first uh, female journalists employed at the, at the journal. What was that experience like? You know, I had to actually uh, go through all of this with uh, uh, the FBI because um, I listed on my resume that I had been the first uh, uh, the first woman reporter hired by the Wall Street Journal, and they checked with the Wall Street Journal and whoever it was that was in charge. And the place at the time said that couldn't possibly be true. You know, this is 1966. That's a ridiculous thing. Uh, my reason for saying it was that that's what I was told by my then boss. And so I went back and checked, and it is true that there was a woman who. Uh, during the war was on the copy desk and they sent her off to be a reporter because they were short of men. Uh, but when the war was over and uh, the men came back, she was told she had to go back to the copy desk. So she quit and went to the New York Times and became one of their leading, uh, leading financial reporters. Her name was Elizabeth Fowler. So anyway, I believe that I can in fact claim to have been the first woman hired as a reporter by the Wall Street Journal. What was your beat? What were you covering? Um, I was general assignment reporter. I didn't have a single industry that I was assigned to. And um, I actually had a, a great opportunity there to um, roam around and cover many different things, uh, you know, starting at the bottom with co going to corporate annual meetings and then uh, eventually doing some of the front page long uh, stories that they do uh, on, a particular, on a particular topic. I did one about new advances in playground equipment. And I did one about special schools, uh, public schools that were uh, being set up uh, to accommodate um, young girls who got pregnant while in high school so they wouldn't have to drop out. And I remember those as two of my favorites. And, but I also got to work on the uh, uh, editorial page and I wrote an opera review. And, uh, <laughs> I found a topic on which my views were so far left that they met the Wall Street Journal's coming around on the other side, on the right, and got to publish an actual editorial. <laughs> I had a good time. It's, it's funny how that, uh, that, that spectrum yeah. uh, can be circular. Um, so you had an early job at the Center for Law and the Public Interest, where you filed the first test case against the EPA under the Clean Air Act. What was that case? Um, the case was called Riverside versus Ruckles House, and I represented the city of Riverside, as well as the city of San Bernardino and a couple of nonprofit groups uh, suing the US EPA administrator then, William Ruckles House, uh, to f try to force him to um, step in and prepare a plan for how Los Angeles could meet the um, federal clean air standards. So the way that the way that the Clean Air Act was and still is structured is that um, states are responsible for developing plans that demonstrate that they will attain the federal health standards by a particular deadline. The deadlines have been moved a few times, uh, and then the plan, if it sh is adequate, um, is approved by EPA, and then it becomes enforceable. Um, in this case, Governor Reagan had submitted a plan which basically consisted of stapling together the existing rule book from the Los Angeles and other local air districts, uh, adding on to it the existing state um, emission standards for cars, 
and saying, well, we've looked at this and it doesn't appear that it's going to meet the standards. It's not enough, but there's really nothing else we can do. We're doing everything that's possible. And if we did anything more, it would shut down the economy of California. So the basis of my lawsuit was basically, judge, here's what the statute says. Here's what California has done. <laughs> you know, you've got to order EPA to step in and, and do something. And so it was truly an open and shut case. And it was a, we won, and it was a very good precedent. And sort of a foreshadowing to some issues that are afoot now that we'll talk about later. Um, so what brought you then to California and, and sort of uh, provided entree for you into environmental law? Well, um, as you mentioned earlier, I, I got married in law school and my husband uh, had an offer from a law firm in LA, which he liked very much. He was actually one of the original incorporators of NRDC, along with some of his friends, uh, closest friends from his class in law school. He was two years ahead of me, and people like Gus Beth and um, uh, Dick Ayers and John Bryson and others uh, were part of the original group that, that started NRDC and got their very first um, foundation grant with, from the Ford Foundation, which got them going. But during the two years that he was waiting for the organization to get a tax exemption, because in those days there was a, a question as to whether practicing law in the public interest could be a tax-exempt activity, all of those people had to go find other jobs. So in that two years, he, he decided that the part of this that really interested him, which was the procedural aspects of how you would establish standing and how you could actually sue on behalf of an environmental cause um, had pretty much gotten resolved in other places and he was ready to go to work in the in the private sector so uh, he uh, convinced me and it took very little convincing that Los Angeles was the place to be and uh, we moved out here right after I finished and um, I started looking for a job and I, I was not looking for an environmental law firm because again there wasn't one but um, I interviewed for a couple of legal services, uh, public defender type jobs. I definitely knew that I did not want to work in a corporate uh, law firm. And then it turned out that there were four people who were leaving uh, O'Melveny and Myers, which was the firm that John went with, and uh, starting their own first public interest law firm in Southern California. So. Um, I talked my way into their office and uh, while I was studying for the bar and then eventually they decided that they could keep me around. So that was where I practiced until I met up with Jerry Brown and joined uh, CARB. So I want to talk about your first appointment because you didn't start, you weren't born as CARB chair. You started That's true. on the board uh, <laughs> in the mid 70s. Um, talk about what led up to your first appointment and what advice you have for those of us that are you know, in the field working on climate and energy and environmental issues who may be interested in serving on regional, local, or even statewide boards or commissions. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, it's easy to say, you know, be in the right place at the right time, be lucky and all of that. There is an element of that in these uh, appointments no matter what. But um, I, I think uh, in my case, uh, since I didn't know Jerry Brown, had not supported him during his campaign for governor, I voted for him in the general election, but in the primary, I actually was working for another uh, candidate. I was introduced to, uh, to Jerry through Tom Quinn, who had been his campaign manager, and to Tom, through a guy by the name of Lenny Ross, who was a, a law school friend. So there's a, there's a law school connection there. And um, it turned out to be a, a valuable one because Jerry Brown got his law degree at Yale. And um, he does 
have a tendency to think that people who went to Yale or maybe Harvard are qualified to do things. And so um, that was uh, that was a way in the door. And, you know, there weren't a lot of other people at that point, again, as I mentioned, who were actually doing air pollution law. And Brown was elected on a platform of activism around smog. He had he ran on the uh, in part as somebody who was going to do more than you know his predecessor had done about uh, tackling air pollution, and so um, I, it was a relatively logical uh, appointment for him. Obviously, there are a lot more people doing this kind of work nowadays, and a lot more very qualified people as well, but. I still think that um, getting to know people who are running for office, you know, working on their campaign if you can, or at least being well well connected to the people who are working on the campaign and having something to offer in terms of ideas are essential uh, essential ingredients. And we may talk about this later. I'm not sure how this fits in with the questions that you might be wanting to ask me, but you know the. Being an activist and being able to maintain your um, standing with activists while at the same time making the transition into government where you have to be able to balance other factors beyond what you uh, were doing when you were, when you were outside government is really the, the critical skill set that you have to develop to be uh, successful as, as an appointee and it's the job of uh, most, most politicians who have to make appointments are trying to evaluate whether the people that they're looking at are the kind of people who can do that. A special thanks to our sustainable business sponsor for the California Leadership Series, Lyft. Lyft is the fastest growing rideshare company in the U.S. and is available to 95% of the U.S. population. Now, all Lyft rides are carbon neutral. This means that a decision to ride with Lyft is a decision to take a cleaner option, cleaner than driving yourself or riding with another company, and will fund efforts that are reducing emissions and combating climate change. This is a multi-million dollar investment in the first year alone, which makes Lyft one of the top voluntary purchasers of carbon offsets in the world. In year one, Lyft anticipates offsetting over a million tons of carbon, equivalent to planting tens of millions of trees or taking hundreds of thousands of cars off the road. Lyft's investment and impact will continue to grow as the company does. Ride Lyft and join together in effecting positive change for the future of our cities. To learn more, visit lyft.com slash carbon. Today's episode is also sponsored by E2 Environmental Entrepreneurs. If you're a clean energy business leader looking to add your voice to policy discussions happening in your state and nationally, E2 is your go-to partner. They are also the pioneers of job reports on the clean economy with Clean Jobs America and individual reports in over 20 states a year, including ones on cities and on rural areas. For more information, visit e2.org, that's E and the number two dot O-R-G, and click the Connect with E2 button at the top of the page. Thanks, E2. So you are now a good decade into your second chairmanship at CAR. It's um, true. The first being a few years after your appointment to the board uh, in, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. Now climate change dominates uh, a lot of the issues, not, certainly not all of the issues of CARB's focus. I'm wondering what were the hot button issues during your first stints and what threads can be drawn between these two periods that are 30 years apart? At the time that I first joined the board, our major issue was whether we were going to be able to force the auto industry to build cars that gave us a level of performance that was significantly better than what they were producing at the time. And uh, we had to force the industry to do this because the federal government wasn't doing it. Uh, The Clean Air Act had a proviso that said that California could 
uh, get a waiver from EPA under the Clean Air Act to enforce more stringent standards if they met a very simple test of whether the standards were necessary and feasible. And uh, at that time, there was a um, brand new uh, technological breakthrough called the catalytic converter, which um, was out there. It had been demonstrated to work, but um, it added some cost to the uh, to the product, and uh, the industry didn't didn't want to use it. And so um, we uh, fought a battle that lasted several years to. Uh, get cars in California that used a catalyst, and then eventually the federal government adopted our standards. And that's been kind of the pattern for many years. Was the fight primarily with industry, or was the federal government also pushing back? Well, both. Um, I mean, the federal government was responding to both industry and to their own sense of what was really feasible, and for them, um, you know, forcing every manufacturer to put this kind of a device on every car was just too much. It just it seemed like it was like the problem of air pollution wasn't worth it from their perspective. So in between the chairmanships, you did a number of things, uh, including, as we said, founding the, the LA office of NRDC. Um, but importantly, you oversaw air and radiation for EPA under Clinton. And I'm wondering what some of the differences and commonalities, or maybe a, a key difference and key commonality, since we're uh, a bit limited on time, um, are between overseeing air quality in Washington and Sacramento. Well, first of all, um, I have to say that California, if you add up the staffs of uh, ARB and local air districts, um, has as many resources devoted to clean air as the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency does. Most people don't realize is, is that. Is that including regional uh, yeah. offices? That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, and that's because um, we've taken this problem seriously over the years and really worked on it. And so when I meet with, uh, especially with visitors from other <laughs> countries who come here to talk about, you know, how they can replicate what we've done because they've got horrible smog problems in China, India, and other places, I start off by saying, well, you know, China, you can't do this with five people. <laughs> you know, it's just not going to work. Now, there's a lot that we have learned that uh, can be done much more efficiently than we did in the early days. There certainly are um, types of technology that can be used that are, you know, less expensive than what we uh, built uh, in the early days of our program. But, um, you know, without enforcers, without permit writers, without uh, people who can keep abreast of what's new in technology, without a research budget, you cannot expect to um, make yourself felt, you know, to, to, to have an impact. So. Uh, I worked with fabulous people at EPA, and the, the resources that were available there were certainly at least as good as, as California's. I would say in some areas maybe they're stronger uh, than we are. But um, they are dispersed in various locations around the country. The, the regional offices pretty much are limited to um, working directly with their states or Indian tribes in the case of uh, regions that have that have uh, sovereign tribes in them and more or less acting as translators of what's the what's actually being developed back at the headquarters in Washington so that was a new experience for me uh, especially since you know a large majority of our issues came from California so knowing California and having close friends here in the various agencies was a big help in, in pursuing that. And I was able to bring my California perspective to a lot of the rulemaking that we were doing in Washington. But the process of doing anything uh, in the federal government is just much slower and much more difficult. And 
you know, we look back on the Clinton years as a, sort of a halcyon period now, but at the time, there was a big question about whether the president was going to actually support us when we were looking at um, setting a fine particle standard or coming up with more stringent standards for, uh, for light duty trucks or, you know, any one of a number of the things that we were working on implementing the new Clean Air Act. So I always felt, I, and I think this is really true, that um, most of what I did during my time at EPA was taking things that I had done or already and learned in California and figuring out, figuring out how to apply them to the rest of the country. Interesting. So California as lab, I, I remember reading Lisa Jackson's uh, little write-up on you in, in the Time 100 a few years back and uh, you know, describing California as, uh, as the, uh, I'm going to get the, the exact quote wrong, but essentially the lab for mm -hmm. environmental policy. Right. Uh, and you as being the Thomas Edison of environmental policy. Um, so, you know, coming up to today, perhaps the issue, other than um, the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement that gives many of us in the environmental community anxiety about the Trump administration environmental approach is the threat to California's waiver under the vehicle emissions, under the, the Clean Air Act, as, as you mentioned a minute ago. It's not the first time that the waiver has been under threat. You mentioned the challenges in implementing catalytic converters uh, years ago. Uh, you also negotiated successfully with the George W. Bush uh, administration to preserve the, the waiver. Um, while some in California take sort of a combative stance uh, against the Trump administration around this and other issues, you have taken uh, a more diplomatic approach. Can you talk about your approach on this issue and what you see happening moving forward? Well, first of all, I believe in the necessity of litigation. I uh, always think uh, you have to be prepared to litigate and you have to be uh, competent to do that. And you also have to be strategic about when and where you file your cases. Uh, and at the same time, since litigation itself uh, doesn't always resolve the underlying conflicts. You have to try to find a way that you can also work with the people that you're uh, suing because at the end of the day, they're going to be around and so are you. So it's an ongoing relationship. In the case of the current fight over the emission standards, it's really the most bizarre thing I've ever been involved in in my life because you have an auto industry which asked for um, something which they thought was, uh, you know, a relatively modest tweak in uh, the CAFE and greenhouse gas emission standards. They weren't fundamentally threatening the California waiver. They were not trying to um, upset the agreements that had been reached uh, back in 2012 under the Obama administration, but they wanted relief in a couple of areas. Um, maybe uh, since, well, I, I'm going to give them credit. I think that there are companies that are facing some difficulties in compliance, especially with the CAFE law, that wanted some help. Uh, but having asked for it, what they got was a proposal that was much more reflective of the ideology of the people that President Trump has brought in with him. I don't think the president himself knows or cares much about the California waiver, per se. Other I than think, he doesn't uh, like California uh, very much, but. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, he, he hasn't been terribly successful in building resorts here in California, so he's had some less than wonderful experiences. He tried to take over the old, um, uh, the hotel, the Coconut Grove, the, the Ambassador Hotel, that was one of his projects, was to build a tower there, and he was, he was defeated in that effort. So he probably doesn't hold us in terribly high esteem. But um, this is um, a situation where he appointed, uh, both at EPA and at DOT, people who are truly ideologues on this topic, and in particular, the um, 
uh, deputy secretary for DOT and the head of the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration are both individuals who believe that uh, Clean Air Act shouldn't have any role in deciding what fuel economy standards ought to be to begin with. You know, it's, they think that they are, they are the ones who should be in charge of all issues relating to, to fuel economy, and they think, by, therefore, by extension, that California's place at the table is completely unacceptable, and they just don't want to deal with us. Um, the man who is uh, now in, uh, number two at DOT comes from a law firm that represented the Automotive Alliance in their litigation in the Bush years to try to prevent California from enforcing the Pavley Law, the, the first law that, that uh, uh, gave us the authority to uh, set greenhouse gas emission standards. So he has a long history of belief that um, California shouldn't be doing what we're doing, and now he's in a position where he thinks he's going to be able to do something about it, so he has really taken the leadership role on this issue. Meanwhile, EPA has taken kind of a back seat uh, on this one. Their, uh, the former administrator, Scott Pruitt, um, tried to kind of um, articulate this as a a, a case where California was trying to impose itself on the rest of the country and to, you know, take away pickup trucks from red meat eating people in the Middle West, you know, and force them to live like a bunch of Californians. So um, that was kind of the political way that they tried to uh, express their their views. But uh, again, the auto industry has been trying not very effectively uh, to say, look, we don't really need to have this war. We would like to try to find a way to preserve the basic outlines of the standards that are currently in place. Those just a few little tweaks. So our task has been to both prepare for war, which we will probably have to have, meaning litigation. And we already do have one suit filed on this when um, Scott Pruitt came out with a determination that the uh, standards were no longer technologically feasible, which was basically a, just a cursory little document that reversed a huge body of technical work that had been done. Uh, we sued on that. So we do already have one lawsuit filed on this topic, and we're prepared to sue again. But, you know, all things being equal, we'd rather not have to go to the Supreme Court once again to validate that um, greenhouse gases really are a form of air pollution and that California really should be allowed to uh, continue with the waiver that we have. And are you really re uh, reasonably confident that we won't have to, uh, to take it that far? No, not at all. <laughs> I wish I could say I was, but uh, no, I, I mean, I think uh, the industry is frightened to death of the Trump administration, um, probably more than they should be, but they have to live with the trade wars that are going on right now, which are far more uh, threatening to them than uh, anything in the, in the pollution uh, fuel economy area. They're also undergoing this fundamental transformation into being a whole different kind of industry. I mean, you know, the big names that you think of, General Motors, Ford, whatever, don't even make most of what's in a car nowadays to begin with. It's a totally different industry. And they're looking at a future in which um, not only is America not their biggest market, but um, in many other parts of the world, people are looking at uh, different ways of getting around and not necessarily wanting to buy what they produce. So it's a really, I mean, they are in a difficult situation. To me, that means they should, you know, pull up their socks and get to work on right. producing what people want. But, um, you know, there's a, it's a struggle. And, you know, what they make their money on, at least for now, are the, uh, the big, uh, SUVs and, and light trucks, and so um, they're reluctant to uh, do anything that might risk their biggest remaining uh, profit center. 
Um, and you know what the administration was to do, as far as I can tell, is just to keep on rolling back every rule that was ever adopted, at least in the Obama era. And I do think that the president believes, just based on what he says all the time, that getting rid of regulations, especially environmental regulations, is going to bring jobs back to America. And that is so fundamentally wrongheaded and completely inconsistent with any information that's out there that it's hard to believe, but then a lot of the things that he says are in that category. So as, as we sit here uh, in the middle of December 2018, you've just returned from Poland, from COP24, the UN climate talks. Uh, the results uh, are mixed, I think. Uh, you know, in the final hours, a deal was struck to create a rule book. Um, there are some positive things that came out of it, like uh, transparency provisions, some things that didn't get accomplished, like agreement on carbon markets. Uh, and meanwhile, the macro climate news is not good. Uh, global emissions again rose in 2018. We had thought that maybe they were peaking. It looks like they're not. Um, looks like they won't peak for, for some time. Many say that the window is almost closed on mitigating climate change. What is your assessment of the negotiations? And perhaps more imp importantly, what is our progress as a global community on climate? Uh, that's a simple question to answer. <laughs> in, in three minutes or less. <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, well, <laughs> um, California is not a party to the Paris uh, Accord, the Paris Agreement. Um, we have uh, gradually taken on a really exalted status, uh, you know, in which we are invited into the room in many situations where states have not been allowed before and have been able to help assemble a coalition of states uh, and cities uh, from around the world that are very anxiously trying to um, shape what the future is, looks this is the, like. The, the under two coalition. The under two coalition, and then there's also the C40 group of cities. So, uh, you know, I was not in the room when the final deal was struck, although we were following it very closely and anxiously waiting. And honestly, I think that it shows the great skill of the Polish presidency uh, that they were able to come out of this with an agreement on the rule book at all. And that was technically the task that was before them this year. People were hoping for much more, and clearly the environment needs much more than that. But in terms of this task that the UN had set itself for this particular meeting, they did what they came there to do. And even somewhat more miraculously, the United States didn't screw it up the adoption of the rule book was unanimous. And so uh, what that means is that the Trump administration didn't try to uh, change the position that they'd historically had about monitoring and reporting and transparency, but has continued to um, pursue what, what I consider to be the, the right path in this area. Um, what I uh, was in Paris to do a uh, Paris, and I was in Paris, but I was this at this time in um, Poland to do was um, to uh, participate in some other meetings. One of which is of a group called the Coalition on Clean Air uh, and Short-Lived Climate Pollutants. It has a better name than that, but what it is is a voluntary association under the UN auspices of countries, and now California, because we're the first subnational that is actually formally joined, although now all the members of the under two coalition are gonna join as well. Uh, these are jurisdictions that are working on climate and on air pollution at the same time, and are focusing in particular on the short-lived climate pollutants, as they're called, the black carbon, methane, HFCs in particular, as being the three areas where we could get the most bang for our buck and buy the atmosphere some time while the harder things that we need to do to reduce carbon emissions are coming into, into place. And that meeting had at least 50 countries there, 
and they were all speaking about things that they actually are doing uh, and have promised to do, you know, regulations and programs that they're putting into effect. It was chaired by the um, environment, environment Minister from Kenya, and there were people there from every continent, and it was amazing. It was just, it was so impressive to see that despite what was going on in the formal UN diplomatic treaty type organizing process, you had some of the same jurisdictions that are either not being heard or feel like they you know, are left out um, coming together and just doing stuff. <laughs> you know, just actually getting out there and finding ways to reduce emissions. So that left me feeling a, a sense of hope that we can, uh, that we still can turn the corner, even though the formal process may not get us to where we need to go. But of course, it's it, it is very late, and and the emissions picture is not going in the right direction. So there's a lot more that's to be done. But I remember when we left Paris. Um, Christiana Figueras, the amazing, uh, at that time, head of the UN Framework Convention, saying the UN has done as much as it can do as a body for now, given the way it's set up. You know, they don't have an army that can go in there and force countries to uh, live up to the agreement if they, if they fail. And it's up to now the financial community to make this thing succeed. And we're beginning to see some signs, I think, of, of that happening. One of the things I was most struck by in just reading and, and listening to reports from, uh, from COP was, and I'm, I'm sure some of you have, have seen this, uh, the video of the 15-year-old uh, Swedish girl who uh, sort of saying, you know, enough with this shit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're gonna act even if you're not. Um, and, and I'm wondering, as you look both in terms of uh, jobs at the policy level, but also in industry, where would you direct young people in general? Where do you see the big trends of, of opportunity that can have significant impact on climate being over the next decade or so? Well, first of all, as a person who <coughs> works in the uh, policy arena, I have to say that the work that uh, Tom Steyer and others did in this last election to register young people to vote and the elections where they uh, obviously made a difference has to be at the top of the list. That is, people can be uh, citizens of the world and can be working to make change happen whatever their day job might be. So I think you have to start from that perspective. But having said that, obviously people uh, who have the uh, desire to actually work in this area uh, can find a lot of ways to do it. And I, uh, I tend to encourage people to figure out whatever it is that they're good at, whether it's art or music or engineering or science, and figure out how to, within that field, work to um, find ways to make the world uh, more efficient and uh, less polluting than it is now. And I mean, the examples are, are just so many, it's hard to even know where to begin. Um, I just wanna, I'm not quite wrapping up, but I just do wanna say that you have played such an important role um, in mentoring people, uh, including uh, myself uh, over the years, both within your, the organizations that you run and in, in the broader community. And I, and I wanna thank you for that. And um, I think mentorship is, is really key. Uh, and for those that are starting out in the field seeking mentors, people are, are usually happy to help. Um, so I have to ask, you have now served now in your second stint as CARB chair uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, starting with Governor Schwarzenegger and through the full two terms of Governor Brown, which are sadly coming to an end. What is next for Mary Nichols? Ah, well, first of all, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, the legislature passed a bill uh, a couple of years ago that uh, for the first time set terms for members of the Air Resources Board, and so um, I am in a term that lasts uh, until the end of 2020, 
uh, Governor Newsom doesn't have to keep me as the board chair. I could just be a member and he could appoint somebody else as a chair. But he has asked me to stay on as chair and I'm, uh, I'm excited about doing that. Uh, I really feel like, um, you know, whenever you get a change of administrations, you get new opportunities. I know people are always apprehensive about change, that somehow things will go backwards and you'll lose. And unfortunately, we do have some sad experience of that recently. But from everything that I have seen about the governor-elect, he's bringing in some pretty strongly developed ideas about uh, how uh, the economy can benefit from uh, our work on climate in California and also about wanting to tie together um, land use, transportation, uh, and the uh, air pollution, and you know our our domestic concerns about health and air quality, uh, along with the climate program. And I think he's, from what I have seen, reaching out to people who have good ideas about how to do that. So um, this is it could well be a time where we make some really significant advances in California. And what do you see as being just on the, maybe this is the last question that I'll ask and we can open it up for questions. Um, what do you see as being the top one or two priorities uh, in terms of California environmental policy over the coming years? Well, first of all, we can't ever um, forget the need to defend our uh, ability to act. Without the Clean Air Act and the waiver that we enjoy under it, um, uh, the fundamental uh, structure of our program would be very much in danger. And so we have to constantly be keeping an eye on what's going on there. But I think that the um, biggest opportunities that we have uh, are, come from implementing the executive order that um, Governor Brown signed this fall, setting a new goal of carbon neutrality by 2045. because. Uh, my agency will have the task of writing the scoping plan for how we get there. And as yet, nobody knows for sure exactly what that's going to be. But a mix of uh, measures, including the probably the need for actual carbon removal from the atmosphere uh, and figuring out how we're going to do that, hopefully through um, mechanisms that involve growing trees and improving car carbon storage, you know, uh, in our land uh, is is going to be really critical. So that's the part that I guess I'm the most excited about at the moment. And I know there are folks here that are excited to hear you say that. Um, well, I'm, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today and for an incredible career of service and leadership on climate and environment. Well, it's been great. It's been fun talking to you, too. Thanks again to the Sustainable Business Partner for the California Leadership Series, Lyft. To learn more about Lyft's carbon neutral program, visit lyft.com slash carbon. The Sustainability Leaders Podcast is a resource of jobs with impact. Our engineer and associate producer is Ian Swanky. Theme music is also by Ian Swanky. I'm David Rosenheim. If you like the show, please rate and review us on iTunes or your preferred platform, and be sure to tell your friends and colleagues who want to make a difference. Thanks for listening. See you next week.